third side of the story, this uh, tradition, um, with our tenure, tenured graduate student, uh, former graduate student, Justin Hushman. But I'm going to ask John Hulwick to uh, introduce our speaker. Okay. Do you want me to do a hand up this way? Yeah, you can. <laughs> So welcome, uh, everybody. This is indeed a historic moment. Um, our second RCID graduate is back home, um, as he frequently is back home in the fall. Uh, but this year is the 10th anniversary of his graduation. And so uh, we thought it would be um, really fitting to have him be our first inaugural speaker. Of this series of a program that has now graduated 57 um, PhDs, which I find to be pretty astonishing in the 10 years that we've been in existence. It's not been a huge program, but it's been a solid program, and we're growing. And uh, we have a lot of students who are also virtual, digital, and online. Um, Dr. Justin Hartz, who got his, P his MA in English, teaching writing from Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville in 2005. And then he came to Clemson in our very first cohort, and enrolled in 2005 along with five other students, um, and graduated from RCID uh, in 2009 as the second graduate from the program. So this is the 10 year anniversary for that. His first job right out of Grad school was well, University of Texas at Austin, where he worked as an assistant professor of rhetoric and writing from 2009 to 2013. Um, he then um, stepped laterally uh, across to the Allen University, where he took a position uh, at the English department as uh, an assistant professor. Um, and he um, worked there as the assistant professor in the English department from 2013 to 2000. 19, where he has now received tenure and promotion to associate professor. Um, Dr. Hawkinson is the founding editor of the Journal for Undergraduate Multimedia Projects in 2009 called The Jump. Uh, that is a fantastic publication that gives undergraduate students the opportunity to get uh, published in some of those projects. I've had my students publish it. Yes. Journal, so um, that is great. He is also on the editorial board of uh, Clemson University Press's series with Cynthia Haynes uh, on race and conflict, uh, editorial board for enculturation and praxis, and he has published numerous articles in his book, which has just come out, Post Digital Rhetoric in the New Aesthetic, was published on Ohio State University Press this year. I am Delighted to give you just a talk. Uh, thank you all for coming today, especially online contingent. You know, it's sometimes hard to get to places. But, um, as a post digital scholar, I think it's uh, wonderful that we can stream this to people outside the space. That's a very nice thing. Mean, thanks, John, for that wonderful introduction. You make me sound way more qualified than I feel. Um, and I really appreciate you saying that I was the second graduate twice. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so it's great to be back in Clemson and to see so many familiar faces, and it's also been a joy to meet so many new faces. I think the program is in really great hands with a bright horizon, and I'm extremely glad that I am not a student here right now because you all are very talented, and it would kill me because I'm incredibly competitive. Um, so in uh, terms of the talk today, uh, I am really genuinely honored to be the inaugural speaker for this series. It's, uh, it's, it's a really uh, a wonderful opportunity, but more importantly, I just hope that as with all things I do for the, in relation to this program, my talk today does the invite justice, so I'll try not to mess it up too bad. Are there any questions yet? I was going to say, have it in class, right? Okay, we've got everything in front So my talk this morning is titled Post Digital Rhetoric and Reconfigurations. And as John mentioned, it, uh, it comes out of my book, Post Digital Rhetoric and Aesthetic, which was published by OSU Press uh, last March in the Rhetoric and the Materialism series. And if, if you're interested in it, you can, of course, purchase the book. Uh, but more importantly, you can actually download the entire thing for free. So um, as part of my work on the project, I secured a major open access grant from IU, the best program's office, and the Big Ten Consortium of Libraries. Um, so it's available. Uh, if you 
you can go to this link, or you can just search you know, uh, knowledge base plus post digital rhetoric, and it should come up. Knowledge base is the server library system and OSU where the book resides. And then you can see a whole free PDF copy, right? And then if you want to print it, that's up to you. It's your own thing. Um, so yeah, feel free to access it that way. I've already paid for it, so you don't have to. Um, it really, it's really how it works. You don't have to pay for this. So that, um, that's why they have grants and things like that. So uh, I want to move into the talk a little bit here today um, and frame a little bit around uh, why I do stuff with post digital rhetoric, uh, the way we get there for me is the new aesthetic. So I'm going to kind of do an overview and then move into some specifics about my work and what we might have a conversation about. So mediating technologies right today, whether they're emergent or established. <coughs> They influence the very means, modes, and metaphors by which one does rhetoric in the everyday. Okay, so they are common to how we do and how we make these our artifacts. And so this has impact on us beyond just making of mediated representations. And as new technologies and their related aesthetics also introduce new models and conceptual structures for thinking about and for accounting for things in the world. Uh, we see this in things like when we conceptualize the brain as a computer, as though we know for a fact the brain is not a computer. And right? thinking is distributed in all kinds of um, or when we see pixels in places where they're not. This is a, an impact of technology on us. So uh, the simple sort of reality of things is that computational screen-based network media have just fundamentally altered, augmented, and expanded the materialities and modalities, figures and forms that are available to rhetoric. Uh, and it's important, I think, and it's an important challenge for rhetorical studies to find ways to take stock of these changes. So the common approach in higher education for the past 30 plus years, and in rhetoric and composition specifically, uh, has been to account for real revolutions through the all-encompassing notion of literacy. Right? We have digital literacies, computational literacies, technical literacies, screen literacies, gaming literacies, there's probably like tennis shoe literacies and tons of football literacies. I mean, there's, there's a literacy for everything, as they say. Uh, but for all of its administrative appeal and sort of cachet, a literacy imperative for a digital or what I would call post-digital condition uh, can be incredibly limited. As a kind of comparative, in the mid-1990s, Barbara Stafford and her work with looking sort of railed against the semiotic impulse that was being thrust on the visual studies in the 1970s and 80s. And her argument was that when you reduce one mode of representation or communication like imaging or visual studies uh, to the operative tenets um, of another, like the signified and signifier dynamic, that you, by consequence you reduce, if not altogether ignore, some of the rich complexities of meaning making that are part of that other media scale. Um, it's not to say they can't add value, but if you only take them through those terms, you inherently sort of ignore some of the richer parts of that, that approach, that mediation. So, um, so in my case, I'm not actually trying to describe literacy orientations. I mean, literacy frameworks should remain as, among the set of perspectives that we use, but the one I draw from for thinking about and working with and explaining various medial elements uh, in a digital or even post-digital moment. I mean, the last time I checked, the internet was still right with words. Uh, according to the president, probably the best words, right? So, uh, you know, it's like, all there. Um, but to adopt that literacy orientation as the primary and sometimes only response to new mediating practices and technologies or a different, the different human technology relationships that they introduce um, is at best short sighted and at worst can be egregious in how it limits our thinking and practice. So, I want to offer a video as a kind of analogy for how we might start thinking about this. Stuff. <laughs> So aside from the humor, I love this commercial, uh, it's a Super Bowl commercial from many years ago, um, it points to the particular ways in which the caveman relates to the technology of the wheel, right? So despite the fuller range of affordances, uh, how they made sense of the wheel was in terms of older technology the platform. Um, now this does make sense as new technologies emerge out of existing habits and um, patterns and um, sort of uh, material economies. Uh, but, uh, and of course thinking of the wheel as a platform uh, is clearly part of the affordances of a wheel. Uh, does that make it any less absurd? I, I don't think it does. That's, that's, that's why we find it common. So in a very correlative way, the advent of new mediating technologies and tools and practices are uh, something like riding or rhetoric stone wheel. Right? And, when, and much like the caveman, when we approach new mediation technologies only from the perspective of literacy, uh, we too end up trying to carry the wheel and then really realizing that the wheel doesn't have something. So, um, you know, instead, what we want to do is what Jimmy Bay and Thomas Frick have argued for a call for, which is to uh, you know, adopt an engagement that affords new mediating technologies their own ontological weight and own, their own kind of rhetorical agency. Right? 
to give them their own space to develop and inform what we're doing and how we're doing it and what it needs to be a part of it. So, so rather than turning to any literacy impulse, my work takes up with a relatively contemporary phenomenon known as the new aesthetic, uh, and it attempts to afford that phenomenon its own ontological weight. Uh, and so doing, I've tried to use it to, to grasp the particular granularity, the privileged patterns, practices, and perspectives that count, if not constitute, knowing, doing, and making in and of the post-visual culture. And so doing, I think it helps us to put into relief current and emergent human and non-human conditions of being. So it's what I'm hoping this thing informs uh, our work. So. And the lack of this sort of notion of the conditions of being and how these technologies relate to us signals something of an essential concern for why any of this should matter to rhetorical studies. So uh, this rhetoric scholar, Casey Boyle, is arguing <coughs> writing on rhetoric and as post human practice, which is a hard title to say. Um, the current human condition is one that is increasingly practiced in and more sensitive to being in relation with technological systems. So this indicates something that's far more invasive than just an increased frequency or familiarity uh, and functionality for rhetors to do things with technology. Instead, it gestures toward and reflects a uh, set of cultural circumstances in which the vast majority of day-to-day -day experiences are in fact mediated experiences. Right? Where Western culture is now so saturated by cultural screen mediating technologies that to be is in many ways to be mediated right? and to, re to relate to the world in mediated ways. And I know this because I asked Sia this morning to turn on the kitchen lights the other times. And so this, uh, in short, is sort of what it means to be post-digital. That's where the term comes from, right? So, uh, we're not by any means beyond the digital. We have to move past the digital, and the digital isn't gone anywhere, much like literacy isn't gone anywhere. Um, but rather, to borrow from Jason Farman's work, uh, we've added a digital dimension to our very understanding of space, place, time, and task. Right? We've blended in our lives and our livelihoods with digital tools and technologies, weaving the digital into the very fabric of our everyday reality, and rendering, in many cases, human bodies and human beings uh, as data streams operating within a computational sensorium. We are people, but we are also um, data points, among other things. And so uh, while mediating technologies undoubtedly augments our technical capacities for expression, the traditional available means argument rhetoric, right? Um, what's more important to me is recognizing how various shifts in human technology assemblages alter not only rhetorical practices by which people inhabit and interact with the world, draw our name, if you will, okay? um, uh, and also with the things in the world, but also how those relationships come to bear on how people make sense of those very dynamics. And that's sort of where the main record thing factors back in, even in its own ontological way. You can see how it wants you to make sense of it. Yeah, so uh, the issue then is not how do we account for new mediating impulses outside of the literacy framework, right? Nor is it really that technologies extend our capacities for action in the world, but they do. But rather, what is the core, um, to echo Walter Hong, is that shifts in our mediating technologies introduce entirely different ways for people to think about, describe, qualify, and explain their actions and their capacities and their places in the world. And so if, if these kinds of things, these mediating tools, are central to how one measures and remakes and or makes over the world that they live in, then individuals, individuals with greater access to and greater affluence with mediating technologies possess greater capacities for action. And so, uh, or to put it another way, those who are most adept with technology rooted acts of perception and interpretation and representation are uniquely advantaged in a post digital culture and can <coughs> potentially leverage more rhetorical and cultural power in the hyper technologized media scapes of the contemporary moment. So, uh, what takes center stage then again is not the degree to which techno human assemblages may render a person more or less human, though I think that's a really important conversation to have. Um, and think about how technologies do this to, to us in a variety of ways. Rather, what moves to the center stage is the degrees of fluency, if not intimacy, uh, that one possesses with technology, the technologically enhanced ways of being in the world, uh, which is, again, is a, an increasingly mediated condition. So it's my contention, and this is the argument, if you read all the whole book, this is the whole thing, right? Uh, that the most important issue facing rhetoric today is understanding our relationship, uh, the relationships between humans and technologies. For those relationships and how they are rhetorically situated not only influence and reflect the practices and pedagogies and purposes of current rhetorical pedagogy, but also shape the very performances and pragmatic engagements that working creatives pursue in with and through screen mediated discourse and or the production of digital or cultural artifacts. So uh, rhetorical studies must then do more than look for the increases in available means. Uh, and look uh, beyond just how many mediating tools introduced different forms of writing. Right? What is needed instead is an attentiveness to the human technology assemblage uh, and as, as Boyle intimates in his work, to how minor and major 
techno-human alteration to introduce fundamental transformations in our capacities, the rhetoric and the available capacities, what he calls rhetorical being. It's engaged in uh, all kinds of ways. Um, so I take up the new set, right, which is a relatively bounded phenomenon. Uh, began in 2011 and kind of came to a close and, and wrapped up about 2014, but it's since resurfaced and has taken off again like wildfire. Um, but rather as a rhetorical ecology, tracing its circulating intensities and flows as a way to identify a set of heretics for 21st century critical creative practice. And I assume you all know the term heretics because Greg Orman leads his way through this program. Right? So um, I blame you on the uh, So uh, while well, the focus of my work is on the intersections and inter interpenetrations of humans and technology, while the object that I really take up with is this thing called the new aesthetic, the outputs, the contributions, uh, or the scholarly interest, if you will, inherently lean toward rhetoric. Uh, particularly the inventive practices central to the doing of rhetoric in the post digital age. And so, before I get into what those contours look like and how they operate, at least generally, I want to provide a little bit of background on the study because my guess is many of you may not be familiar with this thing. Um, it wasn't quite as mainstream as I would like to have been. Um, so, in, in May 2011, designer and digital futurist James Bright wrote in a blog post on a really interesting group uh, website about this new aesthetic that he was seeing. And this new aesthetic sensibility and creative practice that was manifesting in art and commerce and culture and, and so on. Um, and he, he didn't call it the new aesthetic. He just said, hey, there's a new aesthetic going on, and then it got this label. So uh, that's a problem in and of itself. But, um, so he wasn't trying to invent a new aesthetic, right? Rather, he was merely gesturing to these sort of loosely structured set of aesthetic qualities that were happening everywhere um, with everyday working creators leveraging as a model or a metaphor or a meme the forms and functions and infrastructures of computers and network culture. So this is the practice. And so uh, in an attempt to further demonstrate the nuances of the new aesthetic, he embarked on a year-long curatorial endeavor uh, which he gathered artifacts on the Tumblr account. Very funny for right? So, um, uh, this is now commonly referred to as the new aesthetic archive. At least that's, that's what I call it. Um, it is still, it's back up and running now, and you can find it as like new aesthetic Tumblr.com. Um, so, and with each artifact that he puts on there, they, in some capacity, end up bearing witness to one or more aspects of whatever new aestheticism is, or it could be, right? And so the artifacts themselves, however, vary extensively in style and purpose and delivery, as you can see just from these three things, right? Um, but what they gesture toward is a new kind of art practice and cultural critique, calling attention to human relationship with technology, human acts of mediation, the systems and protocols that produce particular computational representations and the human viewpoints that frame those considerations. And notice I mentioned the word human three times. Right? So I think one thing that's key to remember is that in this context, in an aesthetic context like this, the human is at the core. Right? We're not beyond human. It's fundamental to how we think about and interact with these things. So he's uh, right on this blog post, and then he put together a South by Southwest panel uh, in uh, Austin, which is where I was at at the time he was giving his talk. Uh, and that generated some buzz, but what really launched the new aesthetic was Bruce Sterling wrote an article in Wired Magazine, uh, leading his sort of celebrity to it. Um, and he talked about you know, new aesthetic and offered like 30 different definitions and none of those stuff. Um, but what it did was uh, generate all the buzz around the conversation. So there's a ton of you know, internet traffic and, and conversations and then um, blog posts and write ups. And then Ian Bogus wrote about it and then planning. And so, um, the result was there's a lot of tension around what it was. Nobody knew when we had to find it. Uh, some argued that it was just a bunch of junk that Bridal collected on Tumblr account. Uh, right? And then a heap of eye-catching curiosities does not, in fact, constitute a compelling worldview. Right? And so, that, fair enough. Others claimed that it wasn't even an aesthetic movement. Right? Uh, it was unusually backward-facing. Most aesthetic movements offer a kind of revolutionary uh, or a manifesto approach, like here's what we're going to challenge the world as it exists. But the new aesthetic as a thing was like, no, here's the shock we've already ever gone. Look at all this stuff. I think Kurt Cloninger talked about it as it's capturing the digital residue of our everyday lives. And so it's sort of inverted from what an aesthetic movement is supposed to do, or at least historically has been doing. And so I actually called it a rhetorical aesthetic um, and, and think about it as an action of generating uh, critical awareness. Um, but perhaps the most uh, notable response to the aesthetic was that um, most mainstream treatments are treated, uh, reduced as nothing more than the novelty of pixelated representation. And so for Bridal, the uh, would-be Andre Breton, right, of this particular movement, um, these folks were missing the point. Right? So, uh, the, for example, the pixel itself wasn't the focus, uh, but rather it acted as a kind of relay, right? uh, kind of visual shorthand toward larger concerns, like the blurring of the boundaries between the digital and the real, um, 
the underlying systems that A, produce those very boundaries, and B, produce cultural specific understandings of such. So you don't have the digital real boundaries if you're in a culture that operates, but that's still down the metaphor, right? Um, so if you skip the, uh, the computational space here, but went straight from like writing to mobile technologies, you don't think about it in the same way. Uh, so while the aesthetic may have employed, uh, and still employs in some cases, these eight big graphics and build up their aesthetic sensibilities, uh, what it is about, if one can make such a claim, is uh, the overt and subtle impact on computa of computational mediation on representation, expression, and existence. So, so my view is this, right? The given the larger complexity of the new aesthetic, and I wanted to gesture toward, to me, was these different avenues for critique and creativity and commentary and conversation and conceptualization. And I thought if we could just find a way to identify these things and marshal these avenues toward providing like structures or explanatory models or representational techniques for designing media experiences, then maybe the aesthetic could offer something of significance to like critical and creative inquiry across a whole range of conversations from digital humanities to digital rhetoric. Um, you know, we might have like media studies and, and so on. But it turns out that uh, the new aesthetic actually resists this kind of codification. So, um, it, it would, you know, it's uh, they don't they really can't be marshaled anywhere in a very traditional categorical sense because it's uh, as Bridal says it's, it's an ongoing process of critical and creative engagement. So it's always in flux. It's born of a network culture. It takes place in, on, and of network cultures, and it mirrors certain conditions of the network, which tend to resist this kind of fixity. Right? And so, um, but what it did offer, and here's sort of where I, I go with it, right, is a set of gestures. Uh, and reflection of artifacts and arguments and articulations that quite overtly mark the place for thinking about how individuals situate themselves in relationship with particular technologies and, in this case, the aesthetics that help us make sense of this technology. So, again, I took up an aesthetic not as a stable thing, but rather as a rhetorical ecology. And I sort of borrowed from Jeannie Rice's work and turned her efforts in rhetorical ecologies into a, a method of exploration. Um, and so they started tracing the intensities and the flows. Uh, to identify what are four overlapping contours of the new aesthetic, um, often counterintuitive to one another. So, uh, certain limiting intensities are inherently resistant to the categorical paradigm as well, because they're always in flow. Um, but as the intensities move across different um, connections and conversations and, and contentions, right, their edges and outlines or their colors and contrast start to accrete and leave a sort of residue as they move back and forth. And, uh, and one can uh, be able to analysis and sort of ecological study. Uh, describe with some effort the contours uh, and uh, their, the contours of these accretions um, and offer something of a sense of shape of each given topic. And the term contour for me is particularly important. I know it's something I'm trying to add to conversation in this, this practice, but um, because it's multiple meanings. So uh, first contour is commonly referred to as a general shape or form of something like the contour of the hood of the car, perhaps a portion. Um, second, it's associated with malleability, right? So it's like as a verb. We uh, you might contour something or mold it to a specific shape to fit into something else. Right? Um, and the third, contour is actually a practice that's used in photography. Map makers use contour lines to indicate elevation and, uh, and depth, or height and depth. And so, while well, the critical impulse right, is to say, let's fix it and pick one of these, make it a concept, the most critical move is what Ray Armour calls the conceptual, right? So, to allow for the thinking with all three of these things at the same time and all its registers and all the ways that they operate. Uh, the contours of the new aesthetic that I'm going to offer today uh, are meant to, one, to know the general shapes and shades of the new aesthetic, to, two, to demarcate entities that can rarely be made to fit into with, and or with other registers like, say, digital, digital rhetoric, yes. and three, it designates the depths and intensities of new aesthetic as a thing. Uh, so they are meant to function rhetorically and serve as a kind of operative guide for making things in an increasingly mediated world. And so the remainder of my time, hopefully I can be done uh, I want to introduce each of you to the four contours and then push in on one in a little bit before we open up for questions. I'll leave the questions time and hopefully we can talk about those things in a little more depth. So the four contours, uh, at least like, as I've labeled them at this point, and again, it's still it's categorical oriented because you have to put a label on it. You have to draw a line, you have to distinguish it somehow. So, uh, the first one is diversion as of design. The second one is a pixel orientation. The third one involves human technology making. And the fourth uh, element has hyper-awareness and mediation. I number them not uh, because they're ranked in order, just because those are the way that I talk about them. So you can start with hyper-awareness and mediation. They just they circle around each other. So a version as of design, which is, again, I, I think I stole the author title from Casey's as uh, the most human. Um, uh, you know, we treat, uh, what we're dealing with is a set of practices uh, that blur or operate within and across the digital and real life. Right? So 
you can see this kind of rejection of Gibson's long-standing notion of cyberspace, which has been the dominant metaphor for how we think about digital technologies for the better part of 30 years. Right? Um, but instead, we see, and Gibson himself offered this as his correction, the version. Right? He said cyberspace is inverting into the real. And so there's a sense in which we have to start stop thinking about them as separate entities and start thinking about how the real and digital play in the same space to create meaning in our life. Um, and so what this presents outside of an increased attentiveness to things like augmented reality or digital sensors that help you, know, you live and navigate a certain environment is a kind of cultural dualism that operates around or in relationship to one, making real of the digital, and two, making digital of the real. Or as Bridal puts it, it's the practice of giving the real world the brain of the virtual, that's the pixels, that means, right? Um, versus preparing something in the physical for entry to the digital. So if you ever posted any sort of food images for Instagram, you have done this. Um, and I'll come back to that because I'm talking about concert one. Uh, second, while we tend to want to reduce computationality and digital tools to a ones and zeros route, as at the base of all digital things is ones and zeros, the simple reality is that we don't interact with um, technology at the ones and zeros level. So, in fact, the most common denominator for human interaction with most screen-based media is the pixel. And um, you know, even with your most ardent and advanced programmers who are producing code, they're still producing code on a screen and rendered back to them visually in pixels. And so, for me, the pixel operates as this kind of lowest common denominator model. Uh, the, the point of contact between human and most computational technologies. And so, what's interesting is actually that we, have, we move past the pixel as a culture. We've invented algorithms quite literally to obfuscate the pixel on the screen, though this still is, in fact, made of pixels, right? Um, and so, what's happened, though, is that a pixel, A, has become a sort of marker for error. In which when we see it now, it's like, oh, computational error. Um, but B is actually very much like the black and white photography. It has moved into a position of an intentional aesthetic choice. What used to be the default condition of how things got represented, if you played the original Super Mario Brothers, you know what I'm talking about. Um, now it's something you do as a designer to create an effect in the same way the black and white is chosen for an aesthetic element in photography. Right? It's no longer the default material of the channel. So, um, but more than just becoming an aesthetic value, it's actually sort of becoming grand in the ways in which we see the world, right? Um, so we often see pixels where they're not, in like this Google map on the right, which is not a set of green pixels, but rather um, irrigated fields in the border of Namibia, which is seen from space. Uh, and or Dolly's Lincoln lithograph, which when I show this to students, all the time they believe these are pixels, but it's this photo mosaic art practice. And so, has anybody ever seen Dolly's Lincoln lithograph before? This is fast. So if you stand up right here, you can see the, the new female in the new, but if you walk 20 yards away and look at it, it's Abraham Lincoln. Right? So, um, in and of itself, it's a fascinating piece, but most often we see those squares as pixel related, right? Um, I was a wee bit, um, a lot of the current generation. Um, so this pixel orientation is often negatively uh, framed, like it's uh, some sort of loss of the human condition. David Barry first says digital periodolia, so how these things are confusing us. And, um, but to me, it points to the, the degree to which new technologies and tools and techniques transform and move from a non-human other into the human sensorium. And so the pixel, in case you didn't know, the pixel was invented by Russell Kirsch and uh, his group. Um, and it was actually invented to try to get a computer to see like a human. Right? It's literally what it was built for. And in an ironically wonderful sort of way, now humans are seen like computers. Right? We have internalized this computer as a square. Uh, and Rush, uh, um, yeah, sorry, Kirsch said, uh, you know, he chose the square just because it was in a design. It could have been made out of triangles. And he's, what, like in his 90s now, he's still trying to remake a better pixel. Right? So it's, in it with triangles and shapes. It's a fascinating sort of way of thinking about our relationship to tools and how they move from one intentionality to another. The third element of the new aesthetic is uh, highlighting the coagential qualities of digital production, drawing attention to the new kinds of vision, new kinds of expression, and new kinds of writing and representation that are emergent with human technology collaborations. You know, fame film um, artist Gita Hurtoff once claimed that his camera did the scene for him and him for his camera. Right? And so you know, we have the echoes of this throughout the new aesthetic, you know, Joan McNeil, she's a digital futurist, has, has talked about this as like, when these two things come together, they offer some vision, some creation, some writing, or some thing that's otherwise not possible. And so, for those of us who have had the luxury of studying the picture of his hands, that you can hear it and echoing in your head, like, listen to the law of the law, law of what wants to come, or even his own, like, I take a picture and something else comes out of the camera, right? So, um, but we also find this stuff uh, a new number of digital creations. So the top image here is uh, Louis Her uh, sorry, Damon Winter's award-winning photo, New York Times journalist. And the photo that won the photo competition that year was not from his high-end digital camera, but rather from his iPhone and his Hipstamatic app. And so the app produces half the effect, if not more. Right? So this is a collaboration. 
Uh, and then the bottom one here is uh, from Lee Hernan's work, which you know we have this unique thing that gets produced from a human technology symbol. And Hernan's work is actually particularly interesting for me, not only because his image is the cover of my book, um, but specifically because he visually captures Wi-Fi, right? So uh, which is otherwise invisible to the human eye. You have to have a device to see Wi-Fi. There's no other way to do it. My phone, I get four little bars to tell me it's here, right? Or whatever the case may be. But he found a way to use the curly in device mobile app to visualize the strength of Wi-Fi signals and use long exposure photography to capture these things as, as, as someone's moving. And it creates these really amazing visual threat. And so we had each of us right, had this like ball or color egg swir of Wi-Fi swirling around us. Uh, and it's from an object, an object that we wear, that we carry, that's always connected to us in some way. And so while the images are mesmerizing, um, they, to me, they inherently ask us to start to consider a number of things. Like one, uh, what kind of techno assemblage, techno human assemblage allows this to occur? Uh, and two, what does my own swirl look like? Right? This is my, and, and I often think of these swirls as somewhere between like the aura of spiritualism and the gestures of Walter Benjamin. It's like somewhere between those two camps is how these things are operating. So. Um, the fourth contour uh, deals with hyper awareness of mediation, and uh, it focuses on the hyper mediate and hyper rhetorical qualities and conditionality of objects and artifacts and devices. And so much of what happens in the aesthetic is those artifacts there often display an intentionality or with intentionality or otherwise a kind of critical awareness of their own act of mediation, right? Um, and they often make us aware of the fact that they are aware of us, look, being aware of them, looking back at us, right? Tracking us and anticipating us. And I got in my car from my class the other day, and it, you know, you'll be home in 13 minutes. And I actually wasn't going home, but it knows my pattern so much, it just anticipates what I'm doing. So then we had an argument, Google didn't get it. Um, I won, in case you're curious. Um, so what this kind of breaking of the fourth wall does, uh, uh, well, it's, it's, it can be really unsettling. And so if you've ever experienced the 1990s office of the Clippy, you know that in a different generation, this was not received very well, right? Wonderfully though, our Microsoft is supposed to bring the Clippy back, so I can't wait for those big guys to stare back at me, because that, I mean, it drove me nuts. Like, I don't want to add a grammar corrector at this point. Um, and so we do this now in things like Siri and Alexa and TV shows that ask us to tweet, tweet the vote for the winner of the voice, right? But it's a kind of breaking interaction that is natural to how we think about media um, at this point. And so our media objects and artifacts continue to turn and face us and our, their flesh and blood collaborators. And so we have to confront what the assumptions uh, then come with this kind of relationship to media and technology. And so if we think about it, um, you know, looking through the medium to the message in a very bolter and gruesome kind of a immediacy is no longer the primary orientation. And so for, particularly for many millennials and the generation afterwards, right, um, who have grown up with mediating technologies that are aware of their presence and designed to engage them in the mediation itself. So we have, you know, a shift in what we used to champion as looking through the, the interface to the content. Now, more and more people, particularly young groups and myself at this point, there's a certain expectation that the experience itself will be in the mediation. Um, and so more and more we see designers who are attentive to this kind of high immediacy, to the experience of the interface, and to constructing sort of mediated devices and elements that are attentive to these presences that are around. And so post digital retors need to sort of differently attune to these audiences and move away from what we might see as the primacy of a phrases, sort of describing them, you know, and trend toward more like providing or creating authentic mediated experiences. Uh, that's a little bit. Uh, so those things, those are the four contours, they're a little, uh, they may seem stable, but they often drift and bleed and uh, flow back and forth from one or the other. And so I want to touch on briefly, is, I'm not the 30 minute mark, so I'll try and wrap it up in like five minutes. Um, contour one, just give you a little bit of context of how this might operate <coughs> as a thing for, for rhetoric. And contour one, as I mentioned before, it centers around two things, the making real of the digital and the making digital of the real. And so, in the making real of the digital, we need to first think about the fact that objects today are born digital, most of them are born digital long before they manifest in the real world. Right? Real world is a thing. Um, and this includes not only things like commercial products and CAD architecture and 3D printing, but this really well known thing we call writing, which begins in digital form almost exclusively now before it comes into a print material object. Right? Um, so we probably test it at the moment. But, but more and more, we're seeing also things like completely native digital artifacts, like earlier I showed a picture of the Mario question block. That's a real object, you can punch it, a coin jumps out, and it sounds like it's fantastic. Um, or the Google balloon map, that where these natural, natively digital objects are now being brought into the real world and used in a totally significant way. So this is Aaron Barkwell's maps project, and he uses these giant Google map balloons in, in, in spaces to call attention not only to our like um, computationally or GPS sort of oriented relationship to space and place, 
but also to point out the fact that the Google balloon is always out of scale. You notice that? It's no matter how big or small, it can be Google Earth, or it can be on this block, and it's the same size balloon. Like, it doesn't make any sense to me, right? So, um, so Barth also, you know, when they make a comment on that. Um, and then in the making digital the real, we see how we become quite accustomed to, if not expected of, everyday people somewhat ubiquitously transferring material objects and experiences um, into digital spaces. Right? And so, again, I saw a guy that the Instagram is Subway Sandwich, and I thought, oh, dear Lord, what have we done? <laughs> it's the same sandwich everywhere you go, man. It's not unique. So stop taking that photo. Um, unless, of course, you put your face on. Uh, so this may seem innocuous or perhaps obnoxious, right? But what it, what it means for us is that, A, there's an exponentially growing set of digital artifacts for us to remix and remake and leverage for our community purposes uh, as opposed to digital rentals. And, and B, that uh, working creatives and mentors alike now have to think about digital representation as much as anything else. Um, and so we might take, uh, as a quick example, Access Agency. Uh, this is a firm, design firm, who pitched their entire design to Virgin Atlantic on making airplanes that you could photograph and send around to the world on social media. This is the exterior design of one, the interior. Actually, the new Virgin planes have that this interior. It's meant to be photographed and shared and distributed. Um, and so the agency was crafting real world things with the express intent of virtual showcasing, right? And so, and this, so it shows how form and function are no longer the consider only considerations in the ballgame that we think about. So how we design, we make. Um, and this may seem somewhat removed from us, but it is in fact not. So uh, academics uh, routinely craft talks like this one with uh, tweetables in mind. Right? We know that many, are many of you tweeting right now? Right? I, should, I would say yes because my phone's vibrated several times. Right? So we know that part of this in the real situation, this in the real experience, also includes a digital dimension. That our talks are going to move online and out to the world. Um, and so we have to start thinking about how we might craft a talk that also includes digital distribution either from real world photos and imagery and sharing and typing um, to actually uploading our slides online. And it changes how we think about the rhetorical action. Rhetorical and if we don't consider it, we sort of really missed out on the fundamental element of what the in the real rhetorical situation is today, which is inherently digitally infused. And so this is what we do. And it's not like us. If you study art and architecture uh, and do stuff in museums, you see this incredibly prolific in the art world right now. Um, in the last 10 years, it's, this digital space has completely transformed how artists do art. Uh, in that they increasingly design their work so that it does photograph well, and so that or they light the installation so that it, it looks great when you put it on. Right. So this is Rain Room. I was talking about this earlier. This is one of the most um, dig digitally distributed installations in the country in the last like five years. Uh, it was actually invented for a Hollywood show, uh, but it lives in well, at least it lived for a while in MoMA in uh, New York, and it's a room full of rain that you walk through and don't get wet, and so. Uh, which is fascinating because the, the computational systems, it's like three connect devices, you know, that are mapping the space and your body becomes a negation of the space. And so as you walk through, it turns off the water flows above you in anticipation so you can walk and the water just keeps going. It's the craziest thing, right? Um, this goes to show what people can do when they're bored, I guess. Um, it's beautiful, it's a wonderful thing, and it gives these wonderful visual pictures. And so I'm going to abstract this out a little bit and talk about, you know, um, part of what this means is that to make not only comes before to make sense, which is a common way we think about stuff, but also now must include to make available in, in a digital. So we start thinking about as a writer, as a creator, as a digital scholar, as a rhetorician, as a theorist, a critic, whatever. You're going to make things, you're going to make them available for interpretation, but you're also going to make them available for distribution. Um, if you don't, you are missing out on an opportunity to share your work. That's the reason why my focus on I got the open access grant to make it as widely available as possible. Also, I don't think you ever make money on an academic book. So there was no real incentive to keep it locked up in the closet, right? Uh, and so well, there's a lot to say on this. I'm going to stop there because I'm 35 minutes. Um, and sort of you know, leave you, this is, uh, I'll talk this, um, this is called Street Eraser. It's one of my favorite images as well. These guys walk around and they put the, do you know what this is? Anybody, yeah, it's a Photoshop, right? So if you've ever seen the empty layer in a Photoshop layer, this is what you get. So these guys make these stickers. They print these stickers up, and it's got the little Photoshop glass on it, and then they go around and put them on top of things. So creating this illusion of like how the world is designed and created. And it makes sense in some places, but like on this billboard, there's one on the side of a mailbox, and it's, and it's just a fascinating commentary on culture and commentary, uh, how we think about things. So um, I'll stop there, and we can sort of shift into uh, questions. Um, I a couple more things. I want to make sure we have more time for questions than just me going over ideas. Questions for me, is it? Thank you. Um, if you want the sites and source material, just email me. I have them all, I just didn't put them on the slide.
10 seconds or what it No question. Maybe we should ask something else. Hey, <laughs> Siri. <laughs> well, you've already been shared, so you're all. Yeah, I'm part of this. It's good. I know for you.
I mean, we used to get together and share stories, and now we don't have to like, oh yeah, I saw on Facebook, or we were talking last night, like, oh yeah, I saw that, we already, we already had this engagement, right? Because we participate in our lives differently. So this is where, I, you know, when you talk about shipping from uh, like a self to another, I think we're always going to be working around the self, but I think that that participation with others happens through these moments where we experience our, our livelihood. So we got the, 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 I kept thinking this again, like the uncanny nostalgia of like, oh, that's going to be a great memory. Right? Yeah, well, that, that's a great example because it is about creating what the future will be in that moment. And that is a, that is a, that is a unique difference. We good? Check. for the analog and whether the analog or how does the analog aesthetic overlap or implicate itself in the in the new aesthetic? Or is there an analog? Um, well, I mean, I mean, absolutely, there has to be an analog. I don't think you can have digital without analog content. I think part of what like someone like Brian would say is the very fact that you see things like a pixel pattern in a um, on a pillow, or uh, as an exterior design, like, I mean, you know, um, Telehouse West, which is this huge uh, internet server thing in, in London, right? it's like one of the largest internet companies uh, in, the kind of in the world. Uh, the exterior, their exterior building is a, it's a pixel pattern. Right? And so someone like right, would say, well, that is inherently an analog construction, right? Um, and, but of a visual aesthetic. So I think, you know, part of the dynamic is in what ways do these new kinds of representational practices that occur because of digital tools, technologies, how then can we leverage them for meaning and, and purposes in spaces outside of it? But I would think that even in the digital, there's constant influx of real world material sort of sound signals and structures. Well, does, that, does that make sense? I mean, yeah. So I keep thinking like, one of my favorite things that we, we rarely talk about is the importance of the desktop metaphor, right? Um, just a real world object that becomes a digital interface. So we don't, we think about it as a metaphor, but if you, but Structural speaking, any object in the room could become the interface. We talked about the project I did for you uh, when I was here. So two things. One, the last time I was in this room, I defended my dissertation. So there's that. So that's exciting. So hopefully you all pass me today. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be a long deliberation. Uh, and two, uh, you know, when I was here as the assistant to the, the WPA right, uh, for um, a writing program, I built the, the 103 handbook for Cynthia. I built a digital version of mine. And I constructed it as... Um, we had a, it's a TV screen like this, and on the web page there's the remote control over here. And so to get through the site and access the different things, you had to change the channels. So you would like go, if you wanted to know more about pedagogy, you'd go to channel 373, you have to type in the numbers, and it would then jump you to the website. That would be, you know? And so this is, of course, before we had all these cool mobile things. But you know, even those kinds of things where you take, again, it's a material pattern representation, a steady stream of objects and artifacts to give off signals and light in a particular way and you turn them into objects and metaphors for the digital. So that process also goes in the direction. So I think there's inherent to believe. I just, right now, most of the aesthetic as a thing is focused on these kind of digital eruptions and how they destabilize or draw attention to themselves as eruptions. Again, the Telehouse West example. You know, it's the, the technique actually comes from military camouflage. And it's meant to, uh, to obscure the illusion. But because it's on a building, and it's not like anything else around it, it actually calls attention to the building, right? So it's a weird um, play. I have a quick comment on that, but I don't know if you've seen the project in also called Barcode, which is a redevelopment of the uh, it was a, it was a industrial waterfront property, and they, they redeveloped it into housing. And but basically, the architectural expression, when you look at it from the distance, is a barcode. So it is a digital, yeah. um, uh, and, it, and, and it actually. It, People say that actually there's information in there. If you read the barcode, it'll be photographed. It tells you the price is like seven ninety nine. Yeah. So Check that out. It's called barcode. barcode. Yeah. So it's exactly what we're talking about here. In architecture. Um, there's a term I'm drawing blank on. It's in the book. Um, where they design uh, architectural spaces that don't look like they would be stable, but they're mathematically map, uh, sound. Um, there's a term. This is drawn blank today. Like you have these weird buildings that are like shaped like that curves in them, or their geometry is not natural to the environment the world. Um, and then, yet, because of CAD architecture, you can model out the weird shapes, you can represent the building, you can test its uh, physical limits, and then they build them. So the experience of moving through a variety of these buildings is um, an incredibly 
Actually, let me go. And, and one of the images in here. Glad you brought this. Thanks for my time here. So here we go. Um, Zaha Hadid is a, a world-renowned architect who does these kinds of things. So if you see this building down here okay, is one of these examples where this is not a naturally occurring kind of shape in the world. But um, he, he, Hadid, who has since uh, passed, I think passed away the past year, yeah. um, and he's got a ton of these kinds of things where the design uh, is uh, uniquely different. And, um, and seeing it, uh, if you don't know anything about architecture at all, you can't help but think about the computationality that goes into making this building, right? And uh, this is why when people go into the rain room, they are here looking for the, com the computationality, right? So we see when we see complex things, we assume there's computational things behind it, even though there's a number of examples of really complex mechanisms and mechanical structures that do the same thing. But we assume they're not used. Am I out of time? Do you have anything on that? Two, two more minutes. Two more minutes. Well, please. We can, we can, we can change the world. Okay. <laughs> Thirty seconds. Anyways, uh, if you want to know more about each of those things, they are in the book. Um, if you have a question,